yeah but like for that reason it was like we have to use our voice and like we have to like say something or do something and so I think those few weeks leading up to the challenge cup it was like okay what are we going to do how are we going to take a stance what can we do to like maximize this platform that we're going to have and so I would say in that way it was kind of a cool time within the league because I think they like the league and all the teams were kind of working together in a way because I think everyone kind of understood that this is a unique opportunity and like what can we all do as a league to like stand up for something welcome to the two wash ups one pro podcast today we have a very special guest my former teammate at vanderbilt two-star extraordinaire current portland thorn forward and frankly one of the nicest and most intelligent people i know simone charlie thank you for (laughs) joining us thank you for being with us first of all how are you in this uh, new world we, I think, have all adjusted to with COVID? How are you doing in Portland? Yeah, um, adjusting still, I feel like. Uh, I think being in the bubble for a while and then coming out of it was definitely just like weird. I feel like trying to figure out like being safe and then like still living your life, but like being safe about it and everything has definitely been a weird time, I think. Honestly, though, you could yeah. probably get through anything after good. the bubble, after the bubble experience, <laughs> you could literally get through anything. That's like truly yeah. an experience. That yeah. I heard the food was like not good too. Like it was the same thing. Literally the same. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was tragic. I think by the very end, like everyone was just ordering out food. Yeah. <laughs> like I think yeah. I heard someone say like my Uber Eats bill. They're like, I spent <laughs> more money on food than you would ever have anticipated yeah. for like a camp, essentially. Literally. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you for joining us. Um, a nice way we like to start is kind of taking you back, back to before you became this star. Um, briefly walk us through, um, one, why you got into soccer and how you got into soccer. And then if you can recall a moment in your early career where you kind of fell in love with the game that so much show that you were like, okay, I'm going to pursue this. You didn't, not knowing the end, but I want to put a lot of time into playing soccer. Yeah. Uh, so I started playing soccer when I was five. Um, I honestly don't know why I started soccer. So like, so I have an older brother and sister and my sister was like, she was playing basketball at the time. My brother was playing football. And so once like kindergarten rolled around, my parents were like, all right, it's your turn, like pick a sport. And they just like gave me the little rec calendar. And I just flipped to the soccer page. I was just like, soccer, I'll do soccer. (laughs) And so it was just kind of like random, but I feel like for me, I fell in love with the sport very quickly. Like I just kept playing and I was like, wow, this is so fun. And I remember I also wanted to try softball at one point, but like, I think the seasons were like at the same time as soccer. And I used to tell myself like, okay, next season I'll try softball. And then I'll take us, I'll take a year off of soccer. And then I'd have so much fun. I'd be like, okay, no, 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 next year. And then, okay, no, 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 next year. And then I ended up just sticking with soccer the whole time. And so I would say maybe like in middle school that was kind of when I was like okay I think I want to keep doing this because I I'm having a lot of fun that's awesome well you know I obviously went to Vanderbilt with you your first year so I know that you know an NWSL fan is going to be like wow Simone this great soccer player but people may not know that you are a decorated track athlete triple jumper extraordinaire so growing up obviously you were very much invested in soccer but also very much into track I feel like we're definitely at a point now where it's kind of sad that some kids feel like they have to kind of like pick one sport at a certain yeah. age and be like yeah. all in on that sport. Yeah. How are you one able to balance both in high school, especially them being, in my opinion, very high impact sports where you're, you know, conditioning constantly, but it's like different. Um, can you talk about balancing that through high school? And then also, was it always something that you were trying to consider doing both during college or did it just kind of turn out that way at Vanderbilt? Yeah. um, So I would say like the balancing part for me, it was definitely, I feel like being a triple jumper that made it a little easier just with like, like if I was 
like track is a very like technical sport and like when it comes to like sprinting events and like the 800 and pretty much all the running events a lot of times it's like your training has to be very specific and you have to peak at a certain time and stuff like that and I feel like triple jump is the same but at the same time like with soccer you know the type of fitness that we get that would interfere I think a lot with like running events as opposed to like being a field event person and doing triple jump I think it kind of worked hand in hand because with soccer I'm getting fit with just running and stuff like that and then um, I think that helps with triple jump so I think they kind of like worked hand in hand together that way because even in high school um, track season and soccer season were at the same time and so I would like um, oh I yeah you I, have the south has it in the spring yeah yeah soccer in the spring that's t- oh I didn't even think about that that's tough yeah so we would just like I had track practice they let like you have it like as a class so I had it like my last period of the day so I would like oh. go and like work on my technique and do jumps and stuff and then once that like class was over then I'd go to actual soccer practice after so it kind of like worked out because you can do like the technical part but then fitness would just be soccer fitness um but I feel like even with and then at Vanderbilt I guess it more so kind of fell into my lap like I wanted to do both in college like that was what I really wanted to do but I didn't think I'd have that opportunity um I wasn't really like heavily recruited coming out of high school when it came to soccer especially and like soccer was like Sorry, um, that's so, I know that about you, but playing with you and obviously seeing where, it's just astonishing to me. It's like, it just shows hidden gems. Cause like, you are one of the most athletic people I have ever met. <laughs> we were like, get just, yep. I was literally get like, Simone. Get Simone. Get Simone. Simone. <laughs> we talked to, we talked to Shana this week. Imagine this. Oh, joke. you did? I yeah, love it. imagine this. I have Simone, Charlie, and Shayna, and I'm the center back. Like, literally, it's like, just hit the ball past, like, anywhere on the other side of the field and just let it be. Like, they will get it. Like, anyway, sorry to interrupt you, but I just think that's, it's a good point to make, right? Like, under-recruited and becomes this two-sport, like, star. But anyway, continue. Sounds like. Yeah, continue. Sorry. Yeah, well, I was just like, yeah, so I wasn't really recruited and like, with soccer so like you know how soccer recruiting is so early like Mm -hmm. you're like a baby (laughs) or it's like with track it's a lot later yeah and like so if I was to do both I'd like the soccer recruiting part was earlier and it kind of I long story short like originally um I like visited Vandy just like as a regular student just like interested in just going to Vandy just in general um because they hadn't really like recruited me at all and then reached out to my high school coach and he just kind of like helped me get on a team to guest play with and to like get Vandy to look at me and so then at the last instance they ended up like offering me a scholarship but I was like iffy because I didn't want to like bring up like oh can I run track (laughs) you know because I'm like y'all like I literally just like barely like got a scholarship to play soccer so like I didn't have like audacity to be like oh can I run track kind of thing um but luckily there I guess the track coach had like talked to them already and was like hey we know she runs track like would this be possible could she do track as well and so yeah, the soccer coach, Derek, at the time was like, hey, the track coach talked to us and like wanted to know if you'd want to run track. And I was like, yes, thank God you asked that question. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is called an All-American. She is a literally a track All-American. He's like, hey, can I like join the team? Like, I think your track coach now would be like, yeah, 100%, whatever you want. Like, we'll make anything work. You know, like it's just, it's just interesting because you were, obviously such a good soccer player, but I don't think people know like to what extent how good you were as a triple jumper. I mean, it's not easy to become an All-American. So um, I'm sure Vandy is very happy that they they got your talent. For just kind of the person who just watches triple jump at the Olympics, I know you mentioned talking about like how super technical, uh, like the sprinting and the six, 
60 meters, 800 meters and everything like that. How is the conditioning similar to triple jump? Like, can you talk about the technique that goes into the triple jump and how it compares? Compares like triple jump to soccer or triple jump to like- Bo- Both, <laughs> okay. to be honest. Yeah. yeah. I'm um, super curious because I just watch it on TV, so. Yeah. So triple jump is interesting. Like comparing it to soccer, it's like, I would say, so soccer, we do more like running and like, so I never had it. You know, when people talk about like the spring season and that's when mm-hmm. you like in college, yeah. that's when you like do all like bulking and like all of that. So I never got to do that because God, that's when track season was. So I don't really know about like off season conditioning. So I feel like I can't speak to that, but I think uh-huh. of like, you know, in season, we're not like lifting a ton. It's just like, you're just running a lot and you're just like <laughs> fit cardio wise. <laughs> like you just exactly. can run forever. Um, whereas, <laughs> yeah. Whereas like triple jump, it's, it's literally the opposite almost in a way. Like, oh. so we lift like our lifts would be like two hours like that's honestly like the most important part is like you have to be like super strong and yeah. then Power. but you also have to be lightweight yeah and so you'd like go through like a bulking phase where you just be like lifting super heavy for a long time and then like you would kind of kind of like I was saying with peaking you would like figure out when nationals is and then like figure out your training like counting backwards so that you mm-hmm. could peak at the right time so it's like you just like lift super heavy and then towards the end like you're trying to slim down so you're like on a strict diet you're like you don't do a lot of like long distance running per se because you want to be explosive and like if you're training like your muscles to be slow twitch then you're not going to be able to like spring Mm -hmm. off the board so it's like a lot of like short sprints a lot of like powerful movements and stuff like that but it's more of like a strength-based event okay. kind of thing. Interesting. Okay. Um, that definitely, yeah, that's very fascinating because obviously just to the naked eye, you watch it on like Olympics or like when it comes on and it's just like the most graceful but yet powerful sport. It's it's truly in, unbelievable in my eyes. So kudos, <laughs> freaking kudos to you, homie. All-American, <laughs> first-team All-American. That's, uh, that's uh, nothing to shake a stick to for sure. Um, <laughs> Yeah. So you obviously went to Vandy for, you know, being a two sport athlete, as well as competing in the classroom at one of the top universities in the country. Were you, you know, overwhelmed? Did you feel supported? How were you able to make all of that work? Yeah, I was definitely, I didn't sleep a lot. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I feel like it was definitely an adjustment in the beginning. I feel like T, you know, like a freshman Simone year. Was, Simone was o- always had a book on her. Like, <laughs> girl, she's a special one. Like when I talk about people that like constantly are working out, she always, we're on the road, she had a book. Like you definitely were good, better than me, let's say, of making every minute count when it comes yeah. to doing I what think- you need to do for your sport, but also like getting your head in the books and studying. I feel like we all just like lived in study hall. Like I feel like freshman year we had to learn to find the balance because it was literally like we go to practice and then after practice we spend the rest of the day in study hall, go to McGugan to get dinner, come back to study hall. Required <laughs> like, hours that. at Vandy. <laughs> yeah. Required hours at Vandy. They don't play. Mm-hmm. They don't play. It's probably best that way. How hard it is. <laughs> You're like I need every hour just for. Yeah. yeah, but I feel like as time went by, I kind of, like, found my groove a little bit. I think, like, just figuring out, like, okay, August to, like, November, like, this is soccer, and, like, and then knowing, like, okay, November, December was kind of, like, my break period where I didn't have soccer or track. I can just, like, live my life a little bit. (laughs) I just live my life and, like, enjoy it, and then I come back in January, and it's, like, all right, now it's track season, and I think just like finding that balance between like, you know, they always talk about like time management and stuff, but Mm -hmm. I like had a planner and I would like write down like hour to hour. Okay. Track practice this time, like socialize, live my life from this time. That's awesome. (laughs) Study from this time, like just like structuring everything so that like I have time to like, obviously 
do the best I can in sports and in, in school, but like also like be a person. Cause I think especially freshman year that what makes it hard is like trying to figure out how to be a person. And it's like, once you can like figure out how to do all of the things and it's like, okay, now it's easier. <laughs> Most definitely. That's insane. That's a, it's, a, it's I, I can attack, even going to Virginia after, like Vanderbilt is no joke. I don't care what anyone says. It's, it's one of the hardest schools, whatever <laughs> subject you're studying. So it's like athletes there. There's no question why they all do so successful after the fact, because even if they pursue their sport, they're so prepared for the world. Um, but I knew that about Simone. She's Miss Smarty over there. I can't even wait till you're done playing soccer. Let's see what she does next. But um. So we wanted to talk to you. I talked to you about this. I wanted to talk to you about this topic. It's obviously a little heavy, but um, this year has been rough, I think, for everybody. I don't know about you guys, but COVID has been nothing I ever thought I'd live through, um, even though right? I feel like I've adjusted. Like, I feel like my mask is like my new Apple Watch in a weird way. <laughs> uh, but, you know, the NWSL was in a tough boat, right? Because you were one of the first leagues to really like put a plan into effect, um, which in and of itself was a hurdle, right? To expect these players to basically go into isolation in Utah and just like make it work and, you know, sacrifice a lot of things, including good food to um, play and, and perform at your career, in your career. Um, but during that time, obviously it was, um, the country started dealing with social injustice. We had the killing of George Floyd. Um, and I feel like unlike a lot of athletes, you guys really had no time to adjust to that so it it just happened and you were uh, immediately put in the public eye and I feel like as a black athlete in the league um one you're facing that emotionally but then two it's like we have to come together in the matter of hours days and figure out what stance we're going to take and you know have our voices be heard but also like I don't know about you but I was emotional for weeks I think it was just a very tough time it still is but um yeah just talk us through that process of like one how you were able to kind of hurdle that because you know at the end of the day it's still your career you're acting as a professional and doing your job but then also um how you felt you were able at least Portland to come together and say okay what are what are we going to do to have our voices be heard out there and kind of address this issue as um public figures yeah no I agree I feel like when it first happened that was yeah it was a challenging week I think for me just still having to show up and like play soccer and like convince myself yeah soccer still matters <laughs> like that for me was definitely pretty hard um I know the first couple of days our team didn't really have a discussion about it I think which kind of made it a little harder because it's like there's so much going on but like we're no one's talking about it and so it just kind of felt a little isolating Um, but then eventually as a team, we kind of had like a full on like team talk and like everyone just kind of like let all of their emotions out. And I think that was definitely helpful. And we started like doing this thing where folks would like share podcasts about race or like start book clubs and stuff like that. And every week we'd have like a discussion about the podcast we listened to or the book we were reading and stuff like that. And I think us just like gathering around to have those hard conversations, even though I know for a lot of people could be uncomfortable at times. I think for me, that was really helpful when it comes to just like sorting through my feelings because it's like, we're not dodging it anymore. It's like, no, the elephant's in the room and we're going to talk about this elephant. Um, But it was definitely weird, like going into the bubble because it was like all of this just happened. And then, then I'm expected to just like, leave the world <laughs> like and like live in this bubble and it was like so much is happening outside of the bubble like especially in Portland too I don't know if you guys have been like yeah. seeing mm-hmm. with like protests and all of that and it's like seeing all this stuff that's happening but we're like living in this bubble it was like it was just a weird feeling because it's like we're in the world but like not really it kind of felt like I'm like watching everything happen huh. um but at the same time, it was like a cool opportunity to be able to like use our voices because we were like one of the first, we were the first league to like yeah. come back. Can we make that, <laughs> let's note that on this podcast. <laughs> right? Sick the of first. everyone coming out and being, and I credit other athletes, but like you guys truly were the first, 110%. Cause 
continue. Sorry. I need that to be noted. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, but like for that reason, it was like we have to use our voice and like we have to like say something or do something. And so I think those few weeks leading up to the challenge cup, it was like, okay, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna take a stance? What can we do to like maximize this platform that we're gonna have? And so I would say in that way, it was kind of a cool time within the league because I think they're like the league and all the teams were kind of working together in a way because I think everyone kind of understood that this is a unique opportunity and like, what can we all do as a league to like stand up for something? For sure. Um, and I'm curious, you know, obviously Megan Rapino has had somewhat of a stance on this, um, but I think it's fair to say that like her stature has allowed her in, in positive ways, she's used it in a great way to kind of kneel and, you know, make herself a public figure for certain topics. Um, do you think that unity in the aspect of having other players being willing to lock arms and kind of fight this together has helped because I know even, you know, I've been following, you know, the, you know, black players, the end sellers have come out. I think you guys have unified on that front, which, which is great. Cause I think frankly, the league it's time, right. We have to address these issues and, and use our platform and voices to tell others, as you said, and educate others on what's going on in the world um, that we maybe aren't experiencing ourselves. But I'm just curious from a unification standpoint, like how much you think that assisted in the bubble in terms of like, all these teams like really doing it together right like it wasn't like one player I think that was a hard part with one Megan was trying to make a point it was like it was one player so it's kind of easy for people to narrow in on her we're here it was like what are you gonna say like we're in this yeah. together like either you're with us or you're against us but like we're doing this as a group and I think what was even more positive is like everyone in Kurt like I think other players some players chose to take a stance in different ways and yet I never felt like at least publicly anyone was being shamed for their approach. I feel like everything was very unified as a team. Mm. Um, I don't know if you felt that way, but I'm just curious if you think that played a big part in like everyone's courage in terms of making their voices heard. Yeah, no, I definitely think the unity part was probably what made it the most powerful because I feel like if it's just one person or a handful of people making a stance, then it's a lot easier, first of all, just to target those specific mm -hmm. people, but also just discredit everything that they're, the, the point that they're trying to make. But I think when it's, everyone is like, no, this is not okay. And no one thinks that this is okay. Then I think it's like, okay, well, maybe we should listen to them. <laughs> like, all right, what's the point you're trying to make? The league and as the teams, we'd all decided, hey, we're going to make a stance and we're going to talk about it and we're going to wear shirts or we're going to kneel like I think that is kind of what forced people to have conversations do you um in terms of the future what are your expectations in terms of what you're hoping like the league is there you know something that you're hoping happens within the league moving forward is there any goals that you have on this topic just in terms yeah. of like is a you know creating coalition or um yeah, I'm just curious, like, what your expectations are moving forward now that it's kind of been addressed and, and people are trying to use this as a platform. Yeah, um, so the Black Women's Play, we we just formed the Black Women's Play, I was like, mm -mm. The Black Women's Players Collective, which are all the uh, Black players in the NWSL, we just formed a group, um, but I'm really excited because I feel like it's, and it's a positive step forward for us to have a seat at the table because sure. I think soccer, especially in the U.S., has been historically a white sport, a white dominated sport. And I think um, just having a seat at the table and being able to um, figure out how we can make soccer more diverse and a lot more multicultural and a lot more accessible, because I think that is also an issue within soccer in, in, in the U.S. It's just like it's expensive. <laughs> yeah, like it's not cheap. <laughs> and so I think um, just having a seat at the table and literally the highest league in the US, I think is a great like just launching point for hopefully it trickling down into our youth leagues and developing more opportunities for players of color. Role models. That's yeah, that's truly, truly amazing. And to just watch it from afar and be 
you know, a spectator publicly to see that and to see how unifying the mass was, was truly, truly powerful. And I think a lot of leagues took notice and, you know, had to, you know, respond the same way because it was so, so powerful. And for you to articulate it in the way that you, you, you just did, um, I think is, is, is going to be able to reach a lot of people. So, I mean, just kudos to you for, you know, chatting with us about it, because I think that's, that's massive. And, um, you know, as a, as a former NWSL player, I'm, I'm super proud to, um, to be, to have been, now that I'm retired, <laughs> a part of the, a part of the league, a part of the league. Um, it's truly remarkable what you guys were able to do and are continuing to do. Um, so kudos, kudos to you. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so kind of take us through your decision to ultimately pursue professional soccer at a professional level you know you were a nationally recognized triple jump athlete why not you know dabble in into being um to pursue track um I definitely <laughs> I had thought about it for a little bit um I think especially after my last year I started to miss it a little bit mm -hmm. um but to be honest I would say my heart was always kind of with soccer and I think that was kind of my goal from the beginning when I started when I was five and I kept having mm -hmm. fun and kept skipping softball yeah. <laughs> and all of that I think <laughs> I think for me it was just kind of like yeah I think soccer was what I wanted to do and I also, I just felt like I wanted to see how far I could go with soccer. I think just with track being at the time, I want to say like seven months out of the year and soccer mm -hmm. was four. And I was just like, you know, I'm passionate about soccer. I love soccer and I want to be able to give the time that I can to soccer and like see how that goes. So, so yeah. What then, I guess, what kind of made you be drawn to soccer? Is it the competitiveness? Is it the, like, what different aspect, you know, has tugs at your heart? <laughs> yeah, so I would say, so track and soccer are really different in that, like, mm -hmm. so I feel like I've learned more about myself through track, but I feel like it's because, like, with triple jump, you're not really competing against other people. You're competing mm -hmm. against yourself, like, you get on the runway, I'm not like elbowing someone <laughs> off and like pushing you out the pit. Like, yeah, yeah. It's literally... that'd be an interesting <laughs> way to approach a sport. Right. First one um, in. <laughs> literally. But it's literally just you there. And then even with training, it's just you. And it's like you determine the results. It all comes down to you. How hard are you willing to work? What are you willing to sacrifice? It's you. Whereas with soccer, I feel like obviously that is important, but it's also you're competing against other people and you have a, a team behind you and you're all fighting for a common goal. It's not just you, it's a group of people. And I think for me, just like being able to work with others towards a goal was something that I really like. And I also just like the competitive aspect of it in that like we're here on a mission to win a game and this is what we're trying to do. Whereas I feel like with track, it's like, for me at least, it was a lot more just like mental and like, where am I at mentally and how do I be here to make sure I bring out the best performance of myself and all of that. So. I'm curious, Simone, you know, obviously you went undrafted, which is just astonishing Stupid. to me. If you saw Simone <laughs> on a field, you'd be like, how did you not want this girl? But um, talk about kind of that experience of, you know, it's fair to say, right. Even if you're drafted, I think people know this. So then the league doesn't guarantee, frankly, anything. So even as a non, I went into camp as a non-drafted player when I was with North Carolina, it's like, you kind of just go in with everyone else. Like, all right, we're all just trying to get like this one roster spot or whatever, but kind of talk mm -hmm. about going to a team, obviously like Portland, who's been pretty successful their entire time in the league, um, going, you know, far away from home, taking the shot on your soccer career. Um, and really like just chipping away at an opportunity. Obviously now you've really proven yourself and have earned yourself a, a solidified spot on the team, but kind of talk us through that initial process of going in there. Was it just like open-mindedness? Like if I make it, I make it. If I don't, I don't. Or did you feel like there was a lot of pressure um, because you didn't have that like draft status, if you want to call it? Yeah. Um, 
I guess a mix of both. I think for me, I put a lot of pressure on myself. Um, I feel like kind of like I was saying once I was like, you know what, I want to do soccer and I want to be a pro soccer player. Then it was like, it was all in after that. And so obviously I, like you said, I didn't get drafted. Uh, Mark called me like a couple of days after the draft and was just like, Hey, like you can come to preseason. Like we can't guarantee you anything, but like we could see. I'm and sure he's glad he made that phone call now. But. <laughs> well, no, when I first got there, I remember it was just like, so challenging just like the college to pro transition at least for me was not the easiest and I think of like after that preseason you know you're all fighting for that spot and I did not get that spot and so it was just kind of like for me it was like okay well where do I go from here do I go home (laughs) like do I quit do I go back to school like what do I do um but yeah I was just like no I want to be a pro soccer player. So I was just, I was working at a gym. I was doing like a bunch of like random side jobs. Like I worked at a gym, I was tutoring, training people on the side, Mm -hmm. like literally anything I was probably doing. (laughs) Um, And then just, yeah, training with the team all that first year and trying to get my bearings, trying to get my confidence up. Cause I think that's another thing, just like, you know, everyone like in the league like was the go-to person on their college team like without a doubt and then you go or go to your team and go on the professional level and like everyone's that person and everyone's that deal and you're like well then who am I (laughs) like you know (laughs) and so I think just kind of a, a combination of just like getting my bearings with soccer but like also figuring out who I am and like where I fit within the league and just as a person And so then, yeah, that first year, I think, was pretty challenging for me. Um, But then I had the opportunity at the end of 2019. So that was 2018. And then 2019, last year, um, preseason was my, like, tryout again. And so, yeah, I ended up trying out and ended up making it that time. So I was pretty pumped about it. It was literally a dream come true. (laughs) Yeah, obviously very well deserved. And I think that's really cool is that you were able to, you know, you internally knew your goal and you were internally able to drive yourself even through a really challenging year. And my mom always tells me like when you're most uncomfortable is like when you're growing. And I think that definitely led you to have such a successful, you know, following year and obviously in in 2020 um so that's really cool to hear I I kind of had the same same same-ish experience um I uh was drafted by Boston and Boston folded the next day (laughs) so yeah and then picked up by Chicago where I kind of did the same thing is you know you're in there you're training I was coming back from ACL surgeries to ACLs and so like for me just getting back into an environment of high level like and just getting that year's worth under my belt I think was a huge catalyst for me, you know, having, um, going into Orlando. So I think that's, I think that's a huge story that not a lot of people know is that like, it's tough to jump in and immediately make an impact. Like, unless you're just like, you know, a full on national team star, it's tough. Um, so a huge testament to you for grinding it out. Cause it's tough. <laughs> it's very, very tough speaking from, from experience, just training kids on the side. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and also, important. The there's only you know, there's only people forget that there's only what nine teams. Yeah, and there's not a lot of turnover. So every year, another 25, 30 mm-hmm. girls come out of college, and the same. The frankly, and it's not a bad thing, but it's like we're not growing by two teams mm-hmm. a year. So it's like yeah. more and more people, less and less slots. Yeah. And sometimes it's just luck, frankly, in terms of like there's a need and I fill it versus being at a team where maybe they have nine forwards and it's like mm-hmm. the coach has like a lot of the litter. It's like, you know, who just fits our style or whatnot. So um, that is really amazing that you were able to mentally get through that whole year. Yeah. Um, Cause the league so- is super saturated and to be able to break through and like say that you played for the NBA cell is super dope. <laughs> like it's just very gratifying for everything that, that you've been through. For sure. Um, so obviously we know you're a woman of many talents. We've touched on that, but um, 
I'm just curious, like, you know, I don't know if people know this, but you also, you went to Vandy, you also have a master's, you studied psych and sociology. And um, I'm just curious, have you thought about, you know, and we hope your career is plentiful and long and you get to play as long as you'd like, but I'm curious if you've put in any thought as to like what may be next for you or um, yeah, like what your, what are your plans post-soccer? Are you, are you excited about what the opportunities hold? Um, especially obviously having a great degree from Vandy and, and having a passion for something besides just a sport, you know? Yeah. Um, so I actually, after soccer, I want to be a psychologist. So for undergrad, I did psychology and sociology, but then grad school, I did medicine, health and society. And it's basically, I just like looked at the social determinants of health, like things that affect your mental health that aren't genetic or biological. And I actually, I did this internship with our district judge and it was just like super eye opening because I got to see how um, there was one kid in particular who he was being tried as an adult and they talked about like how his upbringing like affected his, um, his choices and like why he's being convicted and like all these different things. And there's been a huge push in our uh, criminal justice system for uh, restorative justice. I don't know if you guys have heard much about it, but a lot of times with at-risk youth and kids who've gotten in trouble with the law, rather than sending them to prison, they'll allow them to like meet with a psychologist and talk with someone so that they can learn from their mistakes rather than just like locking them away. And I feel like for me, just like after my experience, like being able to sit in and like listen to all of these cases and like hear about these kids and like the horrible just like things that they went through and how that influenced their decisions. I just feel like that's something, yeah, it just ignited a passion in me. And I feel like for me, I'd want to be a psychologist for at-risk youth who've gotten in trouble with the law and need help and want to need to talk through their circumstances. Cause I just don't feel like the answer is locking kids away. <laughs> like, sure. you know, I feel like you're young and there's so much more in store for you. And I feel like I would love to just help kids talk through those issues. I think that's, you know, that's this is why I say Simone is so special because you, I know faith and, and giving back is, are two things that are really important to you as a person. And, um, I think like work like that's so needed, especially one, because I think thankfully mental health is becoming much more of a topic of discussion in our world. I think it's especially important. I, I have a passion for it, for players coming out of soccer. Cause I think I struggle with it post soccer. And I think a lot of us struggle with transition, which is something I'm passionate about. But um, I think it also proves a point to what we're going with, you know, socially, right? Like so many of us assume that our upbringing, our circumstances are just like everybody else. And you had exposure yeah. to a system where it's like, you know, you may have a really tough, tough, tough childhood, frankly, that doesn't really set you up to be successful as an adult. And, mm -hmm. and to your point, the solution may not be like to lock them away. Maybe like, how do we hurdle your demons to kind of yeah. help you structure it? I, I think that's amazing because um, I live in Chicago now. So um, not to say, but I've done a little bit of work um, with the all boys school here on the South side and stuff. And it's just incredible how much they talk about like setting this environment for them to be successful. And a lot of them come from homes where if they weren't otherwise educated in the school, it may not, their, their future may turn out the way in which they want. And I just think that's so important. So like kudos to you. I, I, I want you to have a plentiful career, but I also am excited about that because I think more people should invest their time into that. And um, I already know you're going to do so much great for the sports and soccer and WSL world, but your impact beyond soccer is going to be even greater. So um, I definitely need more people like you. That's for sure. <laughs> that is for darn sure. Uh, that's incredible. That's so good to hear. And so, you know, you are obviously growing this platform, uh, being an incredible soccer player, but to have something that's so obviously, you know, soccer to us is extremely important, but something that is larger than the game and larger than soccer and just overall humanity you know, helping and guiding kids, I think that's remarkable. And for you to be able to, to want to transition to that is, is something that is, you know, great for society. 
Um, so you're just an overall stud. Is what I'm <laughs> That's a good word. <laughs> just an overall stud. Uh, so we love to hear That's that. Best. I appreciate so, it. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So we kind of, um, we kind of like to wrap up just kind of with a rapid fire kind of, you know, six questions just to kind of see where your head's at and see what you like. Yeah. Uh -oh. it's, easy. It's, very easy. it's very fun and easy. Okay. You down? You down? I mean, do I have a choice? No, nope, sure. you don't. Nope. No choice. <laughs> All right. What is your favorite coffee drink? I've been into, this isn't coffee, but I like chai. Okay. Yeah. If that counts yeah is that like straight up chai latte chai latte is there coffee in that i don't know so, but is that what you order is this like your starbucks order what is it chai yeah. if i go to like starbucks or something yeah. i'll get chai nice very yeah. cool describe <laughs> yourself in three words Ooh. adventurous driven Fun loving. Nice. It's hyphenated. Make that three words. <laughs> yeah. uh, awesome. Your favorite NWSL team to play? North Carolina. Nice. You can't say <laughs> Portland because she has, you know, yeah. they have a great environment. She's, you know, <laughs> she is Portland. So very cool. All right. Your current favorite takeout? Ooh, uh, sushi Miyaga. It's Ooh. so good, y'all. <laughs> what kind of role do you like? Yeah, what's your role? Ooh, okay. I'm really into the Philadelphia role. It's like yeah, it was salmon. Salmon. Like, salmon. Yes. Girl. Yeah. That's good. I, I, kind of, I kind of one of those where you're like, mm. and then it's like you try it and you're like, why did yeah. I get this? Yes. Yeah. That's awesome. Television show you've recently binged. Um. Uh, La Casa de Papel, it's called Money Heist, or Money Ooh. Heist, it's like- Oh, my husband loves <laughs> yes. that show. He's been trying to get me to watch it forever. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's he cool. loves it. One of my teammates, Rocky, she showed it to me. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's t it's in Spanish, but like you would just watch it with subtitles. Mm -hmm. It is good, like, it's so good. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. And we know this changes day to day. But your current favorite teammate, they could have gotten you Starbucks. They could have gotten you chai latte today. Your favorite teammate today. My favorite teammate today. Uh, Morgan Weaver, because it's her birthday. Nice. <laughs> well, happy birthday, Morgan Weaver. <laughs> We'd love to have you on. This is a shout out to have you on as well. <laughs> yeah. As many people on as the pod as we can. <laughs> quick plug. Well, yeah, thank you so there. much, Simone. Honestly, it's, uh, yeah. as you know, I, I love you dearly and I, I think the, so highly of you. So I'm so <laughs> grateful we got you on and um, people could hear more about your story. And yeah. I know you're going to kill 2021, hopefully without COVID and <laughs> your career normally and have all your Portland fans in the stadium. Have a regular life. <laughs> um, yeah. So thank you again. Yeah. We appreciate it so much. Thanks for having me, you guys. This was really cool.